of gene and cell therapy. My name is Hildegard Bühning. I'm professor for infection biology of the gene transfer at Hannover Medical School and the current president of ESGCT. ESGC3 is a nonprofit organization promoting fundamental and clinical research in gene therapy, cell therapy, and vaccines. Creating a platform for a scientific network and exchange, as well as education, is part of our mission. We therefore launched the ESGCT eSeminar series. Today, it's my great pleasure to announce the start of the ESGCT eSeminar series 2022. It is the first series with three seminars and it's unique because it's organized in collaboration with the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. We choose the topic viral versus non-viral genetic engineering of T cells with three fantastic speakers. Before we start with today's seminar, which is presented by Marco Alexandrini from Antonia Bioscience with the title consideration for gene engineering allogenic cell therapies, I would like to hand over to Paloma Girande, the current treasurer of the ASGCT and incoming editor in chief of molecular therapy nuclear asset. Paloma. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to ESGCT's e seminar series. Um, my name is Paloma Giangrande, and I am the treasurer of ASGCT um, and the new editor-in-chief of Molecular Therapy Nucleic Acids. This um, seminar series of talks uh, in collaboration with ASGCT will focus on viral versus non-viral genetic engineering of T-cells. Um, before I begin, I would like to provide some brief updates about uh, ASGCT and our continued partnership um, with uh, ESGCT. First, ASGCT's annual meeting will be held in a hybrid format uh, this May, uh, between May 16 and 19, with a pre-meeting workshop on May 15. You can register to attend virtually or in person uh, in Washington, DC. As you may know, ASGCT's membership continues to grow with over 4,800 members in uh, 2021. As part of the membership, there are reduced rates for early career investigators and members residing in countries with low income economies. Members are encouraged to apply for numerous grants and awards for research. When it comes to meeting needs of the public, ASGCT continues to help meet the needs of patients by providing reliable and accurate disease specific information through videos and infographics. In addition, in 2021, ASGCT started a series of webinars called Professional Development Cafes for Early Career uh, Investigators. And finally, just last week, ASGCT launched our Insight Series these virtual sessions are free to members and focus on key issues affecting the field. If you missed last week's session on long COVID, it is available on YouTube to, uh, to be watched at your convenience. ASGCT also uh, engages in advocacy, connecting with decision makers to positively influence the field. We hold an annual policy summit every fall to discuss key legislative and regulatory topics. In addition, ASGCT meets the FDA every year, uh, or meets with the FDA every year uh, to make recommendations on regulatory topics that directly regulate, uh, relate to the work of the agency. I'm proud to have just joined the Molecular Therapy family of journals as editor-in-chief of Molecular Therapy Nucleic Acids. Molecular therapy's impact factor increased by 27% to now 11.454. All four journals had an increase in impact factors in 2021. Another value uh, to ASGCT's membership is a, a, sub, a subscription to the journals and discounted publication rates. Of note, ASGCT and ESGCT have collaborated in a number of programs over the years, 
In 2021, ASGCT had a symposium at ESGCT's Congress. And in 2022, ESGCT will have a symposium at ASGCT's annual meeting. The two societies also work together on patient education information, ensuring that educational materials are adapted for a European audience. Finally, this collaborative e-seminar series includes AG ASGCT's members making advances in the field. Today, we will, hear from, uh, we will hear about considerations for engineering allogeneic cell therapies from Marco Alessandrini, Chief Technical Officers at Antion Biosciences. Next week, Tuesday, you will hear about virus-free gene editing of T-cells from Demetrius Lauren Wagner. He is the head of R&D at the Berlin Center for um, Ad Advanced Therapies. On February 15th, you can learn uh, more about uh, combining oncolytic viruses and CAR T therapies from Saul Pri uh, Priceman. Uh, Dr. Priceman is an assistant professor at City of Hope in California. Thank you again for your participation and I hope you enjoy this series. Thank you very much, Paloma. And before we hear the talk of Marco, I would like to introduce him. So he received his PhD in South Africa and then worked uh, for five years in biotech and in the biotech and pharma sectors, where amongst others, he looked into uh, the management of oncolytic clinical trials. He then rejoined at the Institute for Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the University of Pretoria as a senior researcher and looked um, into HIV um, and looked into personalized medicine. Then he relocated to Europe in 2016, focusing on HIV re uh, resistant immune system and what can be done in this regard. Um, he has joined uh, Antonia Bioscience in 2018. And as you just heard, he is their managing director. So we are looking forward to his talk. Great. Um, and please let me remind you that you can ask questions by typing the questions into the chat and we will ask Marco. Great, well, thank you everyone. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much uh, to the organizing com committee from the ASGCT and the ESGCT. For me, it's an absolute privilege for me to present my science uh, and what we're doing at Antion Biosciences. And I really hope that uh, you'll be intrigued by what we're doing at Antion and, uh, and that the science really makes sense to you. So just in short, my name is Mark Alessandrini. I'm the Chief Technical Officer at Antion Biosciences. We're a spin-off uh, based in uh, Geneva uh, and uh, as a spin-off from the University of Geneva and our premises are still based in Geneva and um, we've uh, developed a microRNA technology which I'll tell you a little bit more about through the slides to follow and we're using this to develop allogeneic cell therapies uh, which I will touch on throughout the talk. So with the, 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 the theme being around viral and non-viral vectors and engineering of cells I'll also touch a little bit um, on viral vectors. So here's the background. I, I will, I'll talk some very basic science, but I really hope to get into some hardcore science with you on the microRNA and the work that we're doing, which is very exciting for us. And, uh, and um, you'll see the enthusiasm as I go through this. So very briefly, I'll just tell you about why it's important, why allergenic therapies are in the spotlight and what are the key considerations for these. And then being allergenic um, from, a, from a donor going to recipient, immunity plays an absolute central role. So I'll give you a little bit of a high level immunity course uh, through this discussion, hopefully not too detailed, but uh, just, just to point out key points that are relevant in the engineering of allergenic cell therapies. Um, most important is we're, we're developing allergenic CAR T cell therapies. So with that, I will talk to you about how we're applying our technologies um, to achieve this. Um, and then, like I said, uh, I will touch very briefly on innovations in viral vector technology uh, as closing. So um, the question is why allergenic therapies are becoming so important and are so relevant. So in the typical autologous cell therapy setting, um, cells are harvested from a patient, um, engineered or expanded as need be in some form of a manufacturing process. 
This can then be um, reinfused back to the patient. But the treatment mod modality is really an N versus one, I mean, N equal one based treatment. So cells are harvested from the patient and used to treat the patient. And um, in the allogeneic setting, it's slightly different. You harvest cells from a healthy donor. You can engineer them via various ways um, in expanding the cells. And then you reinfuse these and you can refuse them to multiple, uh, to multiple patients. So this has several benefits. One, you get to really strictly select donors. You get to really define quality criteria, design and manufacture these cells to spec. And more importantly, you can manufacture them in a manner where you can treat 100-fold patients, for example, with a single T-cell unit. So it really makes sense in, in making these treatments broadly accessible, but also adds another level of um, quality criteria that, that's um, possible. So in terms of engineering allogeneic cell therapies, there's many things that come into play. Uh, when you develop any treatment, of course, there's three key factors that come into play. One is the patient. What is the patient demographics, the medical history? And of course, host immunity comes into play yeah, with respect to allotherapies. The product, of course, is very important, making sure that the product can achieve what it needs to do therapeutically. Um, and from a CAR-T point of view, it's really about the activity and the fitness of your cells to make sure that you can have a durable uh, clinical response. Um, of course, the, um, with respect to the disease, this is very important too. If it's a liquid tumor or this is a solid tumor, there's other factors that come into play with respect to the treatment. I also do want to touch on the fact that donor characteristics play a very important role in the product characterization here too. And this is really interaction then therefore between the, the host immunity and the recipient's um, genetic profile. So cell therapies are living drugs. These are very important uh, from a treatment point of view. Um, and they are, they are now another pillar in, cell, in, in the treatment landscape, which is particularly relevant. But these are really, from an allergenic point of view, persistence is absolutely key. And the fact that you, that you can take cells from a, a recipient and put them into a donor means you need to make sure that these can persist for a period of time without being rejected, allowing them to have a therapeutic effect. So although the product is really important in its key performance, um, may, the, there's an additional layer on top, which is the immune response that needs to come into play when you're creating allogeneic cell therapies. So in the context of CAR-T cell therapies, if I describe to you systematically how we see it, uh, first, um, the CAR-T cell therapies that are in the market is, are very simply engineered, well, simply engineered in the sense that it's a single unit that gets introduced to a T cell. And this is what we call a chimeric antigen receptor. On the, on the external domain, there's a binder region, which allows, you to which allows the cell to recognize and bind to tumor cells, for example, and then activate the T cell by means of the activation of stimulatory domains. These T cells in general carry a T cell receptor, they carry HLA molecules and various inhibitory receptors, all of which will come into play as we work towards designing the, the ultimate cell therapy. But what's, what's important here is, is to, again, notice the difference between autologous and allogeneic therapies. And using the same sort of um, algorithm I described on the previous slide with respect to patient disease and product, for autologous therapies, I, I told you that the, the most important differences or the most important considerations are demographics and medical history of the patient. Of course, the disease setting and what, what are key factors here is liquid or solid tumors, heterogeneity of the antigen is to be recognized by the CAR, and of course, antigen loss. These are typical challenges that you experience with any CAR T cell therapy. In addition to that, you need to make sure that the CAR T cell is fit enough and doesn't get exhausted throughout the process of, it, of its uh, performing its immune response. Um, and, and that therefore uh, really links to persistence. And on top of that, you also have the immunogenicity offered by the car. So this is the car molecule. It's fully synthetic. It's not human. The components here are all, the, it's all possible that these can cause immune responses. And this is a really important thing. And, and, and particularly, it's been shown that in redosing of patients with autologous treatments, there's, there's a really a very poor efficacy that's been observed. And that's due to the immunogenicity of the product previously infused. So it's an acquired immunity against the CAR-T product. When you look at creating an allogeneic treatment, all the same factors come into play, but there's additional areas now that, come, that are important. That's immune rejection, as well as the allo-reactivity of donor-derived T cells. Immune rejection really um, uh, relates to HLA molecules, and this is what I'll hit in the next set of slides, but also the allo-reactivity, of course, um, which will come from the TCR uh, and has the risk of causing graft-associated disease. So 
Yes, where we talk about immunity, and this is going to be a really very high-level immunity, but really important for us to understand as we design these urgent cell therapies. So um, I'd like to talk very broadly about what is acquired immunity and, and how and why it is important in, in a CAR-T CAR cell therapy product, but more broadly, any cell therapy product for that matter. So following the infusion of a product, there's the innate immune response, which kicks in, and it basically binds to these cells um, and sort of breaks them down into cell debris. This cell debris gets picked up by various cells, um, and, this, and, it, and what happens is they, they get engulfed, they get processed, and they get presented by HLA molecules. And particularly um, with respect to T cells, you then elicit a, a T cell response against these antigens um, via CD8 and CD4 T cells. But uh, importantly, and this, is, and this is mediated by the T cell receptor, which is uh, one I mentioned to you in the previous slide being quite important. But also on, on the second arm, the humoral immunity. In this scenario, antibodies get produced by the body uh, and they mediated um, via macrophages, NK cells and mast cells, um, which would then target future um, um, immune response against a CAR T, T cell therapy product. So this is really high level, cellular immunity versus humoral immunity. Now, um, when you go on to understanding HLA, and this is particularly important uh, in these treatments, HLA plays an absolute central role in all the immune response um, for this case. In every single body, the HLA um, is essential for self-tolerance and the immune response against non-self. So anything that's pathogenic or is a tumor cell should be recognized um, by the immune response. And this is presented by an HLA molecule. So here's a generic HLA molecule and it presents a peptide. These are the peptides that have been broken down and processed from the debris I showed you in the previous slide. This would be recognized um, by the T cell receptor, and this would activate a T cell if the peptide is foreign or non self In a normal functioning human uh, uh, immune system, this is exactly what, you what would happen and what should happen. I'm also adding a note here just to say that the HLA is also recognized by what we call killer cell immune-like receptors, which are expressed on NK cells. And this is an important consideration for when we engineer T cells, but both of them uh, provide binding sites uh, for TCR and um, these, uh, these co-receptors. So in, if you look at, um, at this table here, where you describe, where I would describe what happens in the immune response, if the peptide is self, so it's part of you, right? Um, and the T cell response is not activated, you get self-tolerance. This is exactly what you expect. But if the T cell response is activated against self antigen, so part of your molecules that are part of your own body, you will get the autoimmunity response that takes place, mediated, mediated via um, the T cell receptor. However, if it's a non self peptide, so something that's foreign that's come into the body and also including tumor cells, if the T cell response is not activated, you get compromised immunity and you get progression of disease. If the T cell response is activated, you get active immunity and it's exactly what you want to happen in the context. So there's a third element um, that comes into play for HLA. Um, obviously, um, when you start transplanting cells or tissues um, from a recipient into a donor, HLA is absolutely central in determining the response um, and making this at least feasible. So. Everybody understands the principle of organ transplantation. You can't take an organ from anybody and just implant it into somebody else uh, because it would risk rejection and graft failure. So essentially your immune system would recognize it as foreign as it should and should, and should deplete um, these tissues. So this can be improved with HLA matching um, and, and, and lifelong immunosuppressive therapy, which is typically used in patients receiving organs. But in principle, the T, the T cell receptor um, of the, in the recipient would recognize the HLA on the donor tissue, on the transplanted organ as foreign and would reject these, as I just described. Now, if you look at um, transplanting cells, allogeneic cell therapies, it becomes a little bit more complicated, but the principle remains the same. If, you, if you're engineering allogeneic T cell therapies or, and I put in brackets here, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation because they're also immune cells that are derived um, from a stem cell progenitor cell. Um, you also have rejection and allograft failure, and it's the same scenario, right? You get activation of the recipient cells um, uh, against the HLA peptide complexes. It recognizes foreign, it should reject these cells, right? But, but also bear in mind now, if you're transplanting T cells or hematopoietic stem cells that have a downstream lineage of T cells, you also have the T cell receptor that's expressed now on the donor the graph that goes in. So, so you also have allergic activity of the donor cells, and this is what has 
what what mediates what we call graft versus host disease. So this novel immune response against tissues of the patient. Um, and this can also, again, be improved by HLA matching, but also by uh, conditioning regimens uh, using different chemotherapies. So um, if you want to facilitate transplantation, um, and the way it's typically done, you have to do genetic matching. And without going into too much detail, the HLA system can be separated into HLA class one molecules and HLA class two molecules. There, these are all the different types of HLA class one molecules expressed on the surface of cells. Um, the first three are the most variable ones. And I've indicated here, there's 33,000 different HLA alleles, which makes genetic matching extremely complicated. In addition to this, the HLA class two molecules, two of them are also particularly relevant. And these five HLA molecules are always the basis for genetic matching. These are the ones that are always typed and are particularly relevant when it comes to making sure that the allograft will not be rejected or they won't be grafted with host disease. Bear in mind also that this is just one receptor. You have one of these that comes from um, the maternal edge and you have another one that comes from the paternal edge from the two different chromosomes. So essentially there are 10 alleles that need to be matched um, for transplantation to take place. These other HLA alleles are referred to as non-classical alleles. And what's really important, the HLA class one, right, is expressed on all nucleated cells in the body. So every cell in the body has these and it presents intracellular derived peptides. So this is key in presenting self and non-self peptides to the immune system. The cognate receptors, as I described to you previously, is the TCR and, uh, on CD8 T cells, but also the CURS on, on NK cells. HLA class two is slightly different. Um, they express only on antigen presenting cells and on certain cells that are activated, um, including T cells, um, and they present extracellular derived um, peptides. So basically, um, uh, debris that's captured as well as um, viral and uh, bacterial infections. And the TCR, it binds to the TCR and CD4 T cells. So class two binds CD4 and class one binds CD8. So now can, you, can we facilitate the transplantation with gene modification? It's not relevant in the context of hemopoietic stem cells, but it is relevant in the context of T cell therapies. And th what, is, what is key to note here is that this little sort of darker um, modules or components of all the HLA class one molecules is standard and present in all of them. And this is what we call the beta two microglobin component. So then it's, it's clear and it's a very elegant way for us to remove um, HLA expression. If you if you knock out or silence the expression of beta 2 m you would then completely remove HLA expression uh, from the cells. And this is indeed the case. Another factor that can be targeted, for example, is the class 2 transactivator. And this is a transcription factor really relevant in the expression of all class 2 molecules. If you, su if you suppress or downregulate the expression of this, you would have downregulated expression of HLA class 1. So these are typical targets which are, which are relevant uh, in all immune um, gene modifying uh, treatments, which are becoming particularly relevant more and more. The important thing is if you knock out or remove beta-2M in these, you would avert CD8 T cell immunity. But let's not forget um, that this is also a very key receptor um, for binding of NK cells. And if you remove this, the NK cells would recognize this for this cell as non-self and would therefore elicit immune response. So it's, it's key to note that although you remove the CD8 mediated killing, you then open up the door for NK cell mediated killing if you completely remove HLA expression. And what's typically done in this scenario, um, groups would co-express a non-classical um, um, HLA, for example, EGNF, which are really have less variability and are particularly well tolerated in transplantation. CD2A, of course, we know averts CD4 T cell immunity and it's, and it's much, uh, much easily understood. So the question now is how do we engineer these CAR T cell therapies? And I'm gonna to talk to you now about um, the elements that are important for us um, in this context. So, so the evolution of CAR T cell therapies I showed you before is just a simple CAR introduced to a T cell with the existing receptors being present. However, in future, allogeneic next generation CAR T cells include additional levels of engineering. So first the car is engineered. You have to remove the T cell receptor to avert or prevent graft as host disease and other activity. And you have to remove all. You should consider removing HLA molecules to improve persistence of these cells and limit the rejection thereof. And of course, there are many other inhibitory receptors which also contribute to the CAR T cell fitness. So yeah, we're already looking at four molecules. But it's not impossible to imagine that there could well be five, six, or seven molecules that could be added to improve the T cell. So we are really entering an era where we're engineering cells 
to perform better, to perform to spec, and to be and hopefully elicit durable clinical responses. And this is where we where we we're focusing our attention, where we're hoping to exploit our technology best. So the question is, when you walk into your local gene and cell therapy supermarket, what are you going to use? I mean, multiplexing is absolutely essential. You can't just do single or or or, uh, or, or maybe even two edits or modifications right now. What are you going to take in terms of engineering? And there are so many tools out there right now, and more of them are coming to the fore for us to consider. Uh, and for sure, it's gene editing. Um, and of course, there's gene silencing, and you have to consider the viral vectors and the form of delivery um, in this context. Uh, and I will touch on elements that are important for us, microRNA and viral vectors, uh, which will inform the rest of the slides um, that follow. So we've developed a, a construct which we call MyCar, and the My refers to, to microRNA, and the car, of course, the expression of the car. So this gene construct essentially contains a gene silencing cassette, and we call this a tunable expression module. And the reason being is because the microRNA has this unique ability to downregulate expression. We can achieve complete silencing, but we can also modulate this to a certain range that we like. For example, 50% or 75% silencing. What becomes really important is, is what context you use this in and in different settings, um, this could be important. This is really the, the core technology of antenna biosciences. And I'd like to show you in the slides that follow how powerful it could be and how it could be a relevant application in this context. So, but in principle, this construct is bimodal, has two components to it, each are driven by its own promoter. Um, and it's typical gene augmentation, something that the gene and cell therapy space is very familiar with. We introduce this typically with a lentiviral vector. And with this lentiviral vector, we can express a car, we could express cytokines, we could express stimulatory receptors, and at the same time, in the inverse, down regulate expression of multiple receptors. All of it is geared up to us developing a pipeline where we can develop treatments that are safe, that can persist, and are efficacious. So in terms of gene silencing, this is really our core business. And I'm going to tell you why it's important for us and how we've come about using it. So over a decade ago, we've developed what we call um, a microRNA construct called MIRG. So it's microRNA developed in Geneva. Um, and, uh, and really, it's, it, it's a novel, completely synthetic architecture, um, which includes key, um, uh, key components uh, that, are, that make this very efficient and ensure high fidelity processing of the microRNA. Most importantly, this top pink strand is really what binds to your transcript and allows for down regulation. And these are, these are four key features that we've designed and optimized to improve the efficiency of this. And the important thing to follow is how you express this. And we express it from uh, what we call a tunable expression module, as I mentioned before. And essentially, that we can, we can, with this gene construct, express up to six happens. And therefore, you could imagine with a high efficient microRNA, then to target and silence six genes at the same time from a single gene augmentation. Something that we've also realized over time is, um, uh, is that by designing different target sequences, which is this pink one, against different parts of a transcript, making sure that it's fully accessible is really a key element which, which um, determines how, uh, to the extent that we can optimize the gene silencing too. So now with that said, I'd like to touch very briefly on what microRNA is. And, and in short, um, there, there are over 2000 microRNAs reported in nature, or in humans at least, um, and all of them involved in regulating gene expression. Um, but they all, quite precarious in the sense that they target numerous genes. So for example, somewhere in the genome, a microRNA can be transcribed and it forms what we call a primary microRNA architecture. It gets processed by two different enzymes and moves from the nucleus into the cytoplasm, ultimately resulting in a single silencing strand. This silencing strand, if it binds with complete complementarity to a transcript, you will get efficient gene silencing. However, if it binds with incomplete complementarity, right, you would have varied gene silencing. So this becomes important also in the regulation context. But for us, most important is, uh, is the complete um, complementarity, and this is therapeutically relevant. So we've developed um, um, over time uh, the microRNA, which I described before, as well as a, a prototype um, gene architecture. We've subsequently improved it over the years. We've made it substantially smaller, um, which makes it a lot more efficient to produce and to package into lentiviral vectors, at the same time deliver to target cells. 
And very interestingly, with this improvement, uh, we've also been able to see at least a five-fold improvement in gene silencing compared to the, the sort of typical mere 30 microRNA design, which was traditionally used by many groups globally. So by pack, by creating our, our proprietary microRNA, the mere GE, we get we get 35% improved or 30% efficiency, but five-fold improvement when we, we package it into this gene construct. And here I show you single hepan constructs against four relevant receptors. First is the T cell receptor, which is really relevant in the allogeneic T cell space. Um, HLA class one, PD-1 and TEMP3, both of these are immune checkpoints relevant for CAR T cell fitness. And these are relevant um, for allorectivity and rejection. So, and what's very clear is that at least when you look on these facts plots that the unstained control, so these are T cells, um, with no antibodies. So this is your complete negative signal. Um, the signal is, is um, at this level here. Um, and then uh, when you add antibody on the control cells, you get, a, you get a clear increased expression and the signal is positive. In our transduced cells, modified with our, with our tunable expression modules, you see that there's a complete reduction expression directly underneath the negative Einstein control. So in our con for, for our purposes, this is a complete suppression of TCR expression. Um, then there's uh, HLA class one, we see a similar drop in expression relative to the controls. This is about 75% silencing. With PD-1, you see a substantial decrease too in the order of 65 to 75%. And TEM-3 is basically very similar uh, and achieves in the order of 70 to 80% gene silencing. So we know it works really efficiently. And just to add, this is single copy transduction to T cells, um, which means only one copy of microRNA doing the job that you see on the screen here. So the, the key is really now to understand how, in terms of uh, the functional relevance of this. If we can silence TCR, does it really translate into a functional benefit for T cells? So in a typical mixed lymphocyte reaction, um, you, would have, uh, you would have irradiated cells. So these would be cells that are supposed to um, not elicit any activation. Um, but when you put them with T cells that express a fully functional TCR, you get expression. And here I indicate you, you can see this is CD137, which is a key activation marker on, on these T cells. When they recognize this, they get fully activated and you see 42% of the cells being um, activated. In the context where we silence the TCR um, and you do exactly the same experiment, um, you see negligible activation of the T cells taking place. And when you measure um, CD137 expression and normalize it to the controls, you see a less than 5% activation taking place. So we know that we can silence it really efficiently, the T cell receptor, and it's also functionally active in a mixed lymphocyte reaction. I also just wanted to touch on this that to show that we've, we've used our microRNAs in the context of, uh, um, of HIV previously, and this was the foundational work for our developing our microRNAs. But these microRNAs were then packaged or transduced. Um, we transduced CD34 positive cells and humanized mm -hmm mice with these. So they formed an immune system that was CCR5 negative and therefore in theory um, uh, resistant to HIV infection. And without going into the details, I can at least show you here that um, we show a two log reduction in the HIV copy number in cells that were in, in mice that were treated with our constructs and, and certainly a preservation of CD4 T cells, the, the key targets of HIV. So yeah, we show functional demonstration of a microRNA in mice. And also very particularly relevant here is that we modify hemopoietic stem cells. And this is really the downstream limit of cells that maintain the efficacy. So even through the stages of differentiation from hemopoietic stem cells to functional immune system in the mice, these cells maintain microRNA expression and were resistant to HIV infection. So a, a really cool feature of our microRNA, and this, this really speaks to this, this tunability of, um, of molecules. And uh, we, we've shown that with optimizing the microRNA, we can also uh, have a desired, level, a desired level of gene silencing. And certainly this, is, this can be seen here. So in control cells, this is HLA expression. Right? In control cells, we, have, we can have 0% silencing. So this is your, your standard line for, for measuring detection. And then with, with one construct, we can silence in the order of 50%. With another construct, 65%, 85%, and 95%. So we have this unique ability to regulate the, down, the expression. And this can be done in a couple of ways. One is um, alternating the target sequences, but at the same time also um, varying the number of microRNAs against the target, as well as the transduction and delivery of copy number to cells. So we have unprecedented tunability um, that can be offered with our approach. And this becomes particularly important relative to the TCR 
um, relative to um, TCR as well as NK cell mediated killing before. I mentioned that HLA expression, if you completely remove it, you prevent CD8 mediated killing, but at the same time, you make this, you open up the cells um, to NK cell mediated killing. And, and there's evidence, or there's a precedent um, that states that perhaps um, uh, a sweet spot exists in the order of between 65 and 85% where you can preserve CD8 mediated killing, but also prevent NK cell mediated killing without the need to co-express a non-classical HLA. This is very exciting work that's ongoing in our laboratories, and I hope that we can present this um, at a future uh, presentation. So now let's go back to the key point here, which is multiplexing. Um, we've got a great microRNA. It works really, really well. Uh, now can we, <coughs> forgive me, can we build this into a gene construct to silence multiple target genes? So, and here I show you proof of principle for silencing four key markers, PD-1 and 10 3 I showed you before. And then beta 2 and CD3 zeta. beta 2 m is the key component for HLA1, and CD3 zeta is a key component of the T cell receptor. Over here, I show you a fax plot of PD1 versus TIM3 um, in the same cells that are separated. And you can see, at least in the gene modified cells, the, the red plot versus the, the gray plot, which is the control cells, you see at least a log reduction in both. Um, TIM3 and PD-1 expression. So the space between the dotted lines is your overall loss of expression of two markers simultaneously. And because I can't put all four markers in the same plot, I'm showing you a second one um, where I do T cell receptor versus HLA class one. And here we show TCR silencing and HLA class one. Again, the loss of expression is between the dotted lines and you can see substantial loss of expression. So this is really all in the same cell gated on the modified population. So we've also very excitingly presented going up to five hairpins. Um, and in this scenario, um, we've added uh, our, our benchmark CCR5, which originally developed. But essentially, um, what I want to show you is the top is, <coughs> is the unstained control cells, the control signals in the gray. Um, the key here really is that um, uh, uh, the red is the, the one hairpin. So a single hairpin efficiency, which I showed you before, you see substantial loss in expression um, and, and what's most important is when you build, when we build a five hairpin construct, that the fifth hairpin maintains the efficiency of if it was in a single hairpin construct. And, and this has been really important for us. And we presented this at ICT as opposed to last year. And I'm really hoping that we can present to you uh, um, a sixth hairpin construct very shortly. So now we've shown the extreme capability of our microRNAs um, in multiplex, but now how relevant can we make it? And we build it into to CAR T cells. So what we've done here is we've created anti-CD19 CAR T cells, the typical benchmark FMC63 clone, um, which is the one used in products in the market. Um, this is the CAR that's been introduced and we also silenced three relevant receptors, the T cell receptor, HLA and PD-1. And here again, similarly, I show you T cell receptor versus HLA class one. The red plot is what we call MyCAR T cells. So these ones carry the CAR as well as the microRNAs. You see substantial loss of expression for T cell receptor as well as HLA one relative to the to cells transduced with the CAR only. So they express only CD19 CAR. When you add the microRNA, you see this clear and distinct loss of expression. Here is the aligning histograms for that. And then thirdly, I just indicate the PD one here. Um, where there's essential loss expression on, on the red plot relative to CAR19 transduced cells. This we also presented, I'm very happy to say, at ASGCT uh, last year. So I also want to touch on one more uh, poster that we presented at ASGCT and, and proudly to admit uh, and to say that this is a, a poster we won an award for at ASGCT. I'm hoping we can do the same this year. Um, but in short, uh, we created gene constructs, a CAR T cell with just immune checkpoint silencing, so not an cell. And we created micro 19 cells with PD-1 silencing, micro 19 cells with TIM-3 silencing, and then the combination two together. And here I can just show you the plots to, to confirm the expression. In the lower quadrants, you have the unmodified cells, but as the cells are modified and become core positive, you see the loss of expression of PD-1. The PD-1 expression is positive here in the unmodified cells, but it's completely gone here um, in the modified cells. When you remove uh, just when you silence just TEM3, you see no effect on PD-1 as you would expect. You see complete PD-1 expression in both the right-hand quadrants. But of course, what's very cool when you put the PD-1 and the TEM3 together, you then see the loss of 
PD-1 expression. This becomes more visible and, and clearer here when you look at TIM3 expression. The TIM3 expression um, um, remains high in both uh, um, uh, the modified and the unmodified cells just when you add microRNA against PD-1 together with a CAR. Add just PD-1 silencing and you see complete loss of expression in the modified cells, um, whereas the unmodified cells maintain TIM3 expression, so this quadrant is basically empty. And similarly here, when you add the two together, this quadrant is empty, whereas in the unmodified cells, it's present here. We also then functionally test these cells for specific cyto cytotoxicity, and we show that they maintain cytotoxicity um, over a range of affected or target ratios against JECO cells expressing CD19. And again, please check out our poster that we presented last year in this regard. So, so now I'd like to touch on key elements of what, I, what we feel are particularly beneficial for the use of our technology. Um, gene editing approaches, um, for example, CRISPR, Talon, or zinc figures are extremely efficient in what they do, except when it comes to multiplex editing, it becomes slightly more difficult. Uh, and the reason being is because for every edit, for every gene that, wants to, that you would like to have modified, the edit needs to happen independently, right? So um, you can imagine these as multiple genome engineering steps that need to take place. Uh, and, you, and you rely on making sure that all of these components that do the editing get into the cell at the same time for you to have an efficient product in the end. So um, multiple edits are required and you have decreasing efficiency clearly with every single edit that you add. And of course, with gene editing, you also have um, the risk of chromosomal translocations and also the compromisation of, uh, of cell viability in the process. So typically what happens, some groups would do um, two or, or possibly even three edits to achieve a multiplex um, gene modification of cells. In our context, using the MyCore platform, it's the straightforward gene augmentation, something the industry knows and has been doing for years and years. We just add the microRNA for additional functionality. So in this context, you introduce a viral interval vector. You can express the car, express these molecules, silence these receptors. So, so you add this additive and subtractive effect within a single engineering step. It's a single edit of the genome that's taking place to elicit all these responses at the same time. And this is where we think they are key benefits for us. So, so shown to you in a slightly different manner, in a multiplexing context, as you increase the number of modifications and receptors that you would like to target, if we transduce with our micro construct, the efficiency remains the same. We know that if a cell is modified, it carries all the components, therefore you have complete uniformity in expression of the microRNA as well as the car. When it comes to gene editing, because each of them function as an independent step, as you increase the number of edits that you would like to achieve, the efficiency drops significantly. And here's an example uh, in terms of numbers. If we're able to transduce cells with 60% using our micro technology, this remains flat throughout the process, right? But with gene editing, even though you can achieve high efficient gene editing, starting with 80%, with every modification, the efficiency drops significantly. And this is something that really becomes pertinent, not to mention the, the implication on cell viability. So here's, a, here's a, an, another scenario for you. If we wanted to create a CAR T cell, expressing a CAR and then removing two receptors, the TCR and HLA class one, let's call it a typical allogeneic product. Once you've modified the cells with any gene editing approach, whether it's viral vector transduction first for the car or followed by gene editing, or if you do homology directed repair to insert the car into a locus, um, you have the same efficiencies taking place. And what I've taken here is it's basically state of the art in terms of single modifications. In the, modif in the engineering of these cells, typically when you create an other product, you would have to do a TCR depletion, depletion. So in other words, remove the unmodified cells that still maintain full TCR expression. So ultimately, with, when you com compare a gene editing approach versus the MyCar approach, you end up with the same principle in terms of TCR, being, of the cells being 99% TCR negative because you remove them completely. So here we're on par, exactly the same, right? But because the modification takes place, you get um, on every single unit, only 70% of these cells are most likely to be CAR positive, right? Um, and the remainder of the cells are a mix of either having just TCR um, silencing, not CAR or TCR and HLA or just HLA. It's a, it's a mix of cells. These cells will be rejected or depleted depending on the therapeutic strategy. Once we've done the TCR depletion, we know that TCR 
cells that are TCR, um, TCR negative carry the car as well as a complete microRNA, like I said, and therefore with separation, you essentially have all the modifications taking place. So this really adds an a level of efficiency to the way we engineer cells. So with that said, I'd like to just close with a couple of slides on innovations relating to viral vector um, technology, which is becoming particularly important um, in the next era um, of, of cell engineering, I would say. So, so the direct infusion of viral vectors. So in other words, a viral vector manufactured infused into the body, which is then enabled to target a T cell and engineer the T cell into a CAR T cell for therapeutic effect. I think it's, it's extremely promising and offers a really elegant solution for off the shelf provision in the future. However, it's, it's very new and traditionally has been challenged uh, by several factors in the past, particularly the ability to target delivery, <coughs> to target the delivery against uh, or to T cells only. Lentivectors generally target many different cells, so you really have to target it towards T cells. Um, and this is something that many groups are working on right now. Bear in mind the immunogenicity of viral vectors once they're infused into patients. Um, and of course, the efficiency of gene delivery. Can you get it to cells and then can you efficiently engineer these cells um, in vivo, right? With all the other immune system components around this taking place. So another key variable to bear in mind is the vector dosage per infusion. For you to infuse viral vectors and to target sufficient number of T cells, you really have to be looking in the order of a few billion cells for inf uh, viral vectors for infusion. And this has a direct implication on already strained global supply and demand for viral vectors, which is particularly pertinent and something we, we have experience with. So traditional lentiviral vectors um, manufacturing is particularly inefficient, right? So normally you have three or four different plasmids, uh, one carrying the transgene, for example, the car, which would then be infused or so would be transfected um, to, a, to a producer cell line. Um, and, and thereafter, you would be able to do a harvest. Um, but you rely, again, similar in the gene editing approach, you rely on all these plasmids getting into a cell for you to produce a functional viral vector. So you, you yield in the end, you may get many non-functional viral vectors taking place. And therefore, it's critically important to do um, uh, to measure viral titers with transducing units, making sure that all of them are functional. The problem is, again, there's pure recovery. So there are many challenges, and this has been going on for a very long time. It's nothing new. You generally have low yields um, taking place. You have limited harvesting cycles because the viral vectors themselves are toxic um, toward the producer cell lines. So you can only produce a small amount at a time per batch. Um, it requires extensive QC and release testing. It's not suitable for late stage clinical trials, of course. Phase one, two studies, you can get by doing this for a small number of patients. But when you start scaling up, it's just not feasible. And of course, the high manufacturing costs that go with that. Producing a stable antiviral vector cell line, in other words, all those placements integrated within a cell line, which then can be grown up and then induced to produce viral vectors, you get, you make sure at least you get a higher quality and a higher yield um, of cells. Um, and you can, because you can pulse the induction and the production, you can have many more cycles of production. So you have really a higher number of um, viral vectors that can be produced. There are key advantages to this, of course, it's far more simplified in terms of manufacturing and therefore GMP friendly. Um, you get a stable and high recovery of viral vectors, so the production line is a lot more reliable. And, and you, it's certainly amenable to scale up um, and significantly reduces cost of goods. So as we grow in the cell and gene therapy space and we start imagining in vivo delivery, the packaging cell line or something like this, a stable producer cell line becomes particularly pertinent. So with that said, I'd like to close off by saying that allergenic therapies for sure offer promising solutions and can ensure broad access um, for cell and gene therapy products. And this is why it particularly interests us. Um, over and above the factors determining the success of the cell therapy itself, the allergenic cell therapies are further challenged by rejection of the immune system, and therefore it requires additional layers of engineering. And therefore, the future of allergenic next generation CAR T cells really relies on a safe and efficient multiplex cell engineering um, platform and capabilities. So, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much for this exciting talk and all of these impressive data and um, sharing of thoughts. Um, I, I invite again our audience to type in questions for the, in the chat and let us start with the first ones. So uh, we have received from Katharine Calvaro, 
the question, what about the expression absence of HLA-1 and 2 of bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells? Can this be leveraged to, re um, to reduce rejection reactions in allergen uh, therapies? Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, it's a topic that I'm not completely familiar with, but indeed, for sure, the co-infusion of MACs, um, which is typically done in the context or it is being explored for co-infusion with, um, with, for hemopoietic stem cell transplant can certainly mediate and immune modulate the expression of HLA. So, so absolutely, it can be something that added to the treatment. But I would like to argue that if you can engineer it into the therapeutic treatment from the outset, I would say there's an advantage and, and as an additional cofactor that, that's not required following, infusion, following the infusion. Thanks. Uh, Pietro uh, is asking, how can one in vitro expand T cells in which CD3 setter got silenced through car delivered CD, uh, CD3 setter activation? Yeah, absolutely. So this, this is certainly something uh, that, that has been challenged in the industry for sure. But uh, from my point of view, if you start off with a, an adequate number of cells, do a, a very strong activation and then expand these cells over a period of, let's call it between, between 15 and 21 days, you get a sufficient number of cells. I would be reluctant to reactivate cells because you have this, um, the risk of terminally differentiating them so they become um, less uh, uh, stem cell memory or naive-like and therefore become less effective. And we've seen this in some of our experiments. So. I, I, would, I would prefer to stick with one stimulation and expand these cells as long as they can continue through the full proliferation cycle until resting state. And of course, certainly you, could, you could certainly modulate um, the expansion of these cells with, with media at the same time, but I would, I would be reluctant to reactivate by the TCR. And, and you can't in any case with the TCR being removed. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, when we come to your mentioning of the sweet spot, so with regard to how much HLA-1 should be remained on the, on the cells. Can you allude on this a little bit more? Because I mean, this obviously would, it would be a great solution. Absolutely. I mean, so, so like I showed you, we've created constructs to, to regulate the down, uh, the suppression from 50% to 95%. And uh, I mean, there is data that's been represented in the past in different contexts, um, not in the context of T cells, um, uh, where they show that for sure that this, the NK cell mediated recognition is far more sensitive than CD8 T cells. So you need to remove a lot of um, uh, HLA for CD8 recognition, but if you have a little bit of HLA left, it's enough for NK cells to not recognize them as foreign. So we don't know the answer yet. I would love to be able to give you that. And like I said, we are working on this. And we've created gene constructs to test with and without non-classical um, markers. So, so I'm hoping that we can present very exciting data within the next few months, uh, maybe on a forum like this again. Great. And I mean, I was also impressed to see that you could do this multiplexing and had this nice, uh, uh, nice efficacy independent of where you put which, um, which of the microRNA. Um, I was wondering and would like to come back to your uh, last uh, mentioning about viral vector or vector platforms to, to be used. So what do you think, which one could be most likely tailored to, to work in, in your respective um, applications? Because you showed the lentis, you, know, show, you were alluding about ex vivo, in vivo. So what do you think, where, where are we going to? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that this, this is a very good question and uh, something actually quite exciting that we're playing with. So if you had to imagine engineering T cells for a therapeutic effect, um, there's two, you, we can effectively imagine two off the shelf settings. One being ex vivo expanded engineered um, CAR T cells, as I described you. So in other words, from a healthy donor, carefully selected, modified, expanded up and then infused, right? Mm -hmm. this, comp this process is complicated, right? It's, there's many steps to it, but you have the opportunity to do the QC. You're not in a rush. You can qualify the product fully in the end. The in vivo delivery has this advantage of being infused directly, right? But I think the, the challenge is going to be the viral vector dose. I think there's certainly, you can, and it's been shown in vitro and in preclinical work that you can target CD4 and CD8 T cells. Um, but the, the, the vector dosage, I think, is something that is really a concern. So... Number one, being able to target enough T cells um, and then also having the production 
is efficient production of these cells. You really have to imagine a high dose of infusion, and that needs to be balanced by the immune reaction against this. So it, I think it's there's a lot to be resolved here, but but certainly a very exciting space, and, and we, we're very intrigued to explore it ourselves too. So it, it's very intriguing uh, to go down this line. Thanks. Um, we have nice comments to your uh, talk. So really, um, it's uh, Marco looking forward to doing some multiplex engineering tool shopping. And, <laughs> <laughs> on, and yeah. also, uh, Catherine and Pietro, um, mm. congratulate you to your talk, as do I. And yeah. at the moment, I don't see any further question. So again, I really, really would like to thank you and to thank also the ASGCT to team up with us to um, start this mini series. And um, I would like to let you know that you can see this talk again, if you like, because it re will remain online. And again, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And from my side, uh, Yoga, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, um, for you and everyone listening, and also for the wonderful team that we have here at Anti Advice Sciences. None of this would be possible without the help and support. So thank you. Thank you, and bye bye. bye.